There's a solitary, humble, wooden structure on a windswept hill in rural New England. To open the door is to engage our minds, our hearts, and our imaginations. In this place, preachers and professors, past and present, come alive as they walk the aisle, ascend the pulpit stairs, and teach. From theology, from history, and from the Word of God, welcome to the Saybrook Meeting House, an audio production of Saybrook Ministries. Chapter 1 of the Westminster Confession of Faith Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men inexcusable, yet they are not sufficient to give that salvation of God and of His will, which is necessary unto salvation. Therefore it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in divers manners to reveal Himself and to declare that his will unto his church, and afterwards for the better preserving and propagating of the truth, and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world, to commit the same wholly unto writing, which maketh the holy scriptures to be most necessary, those former ways of God's revealing His will unto His people being now ceased. Under the name of Holy Scripture, or the Word of God written, are now contained all the books of the Old and New Testament, which are these. And it enumerates from Genesis to Revelation. I need not take time to do that. Section 2 is concluded with this simple sentence, all which, that is these 66 books which are enumerated, are given by inspiration of God to be the rule of faith and life. The books commonly called Apocrypha, are <coughs> not being of divine inspiration, are no part of the canon, uh, the list, see that means, of the scripture, and therefore are of no authority in the church of God, nor to be otherwise approved or made use of than other human writings. The authority of the Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed and obeyed dependeth not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof. And therefore it is to be received because it is the Word of God. We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to an high and reverent esteem of Holy Scripture and the heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, the many other incomparable excellencies and the entire perfection thereof are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence itself to be the Word of God. Yet, notwithstanding our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and the divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the Word in our hearts. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for His own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is an either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. Nevertheless, we acknowledge the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as are revealed in the Word. And there are some circumstances concerning the worship of God and the government of the church common to human actions and society 
which are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence, according to the general rules of the Word of God, which are always to be observed. All things in Scripture are not alike plain in themselves. That's a relief to a great many of you, I'm sure. Nor alike clear unto all. I'm one of them. Yet those things which are necessary to be known, believed and observed for salvation, are so clearly understood, propounded and opened in the same some place of Scripture or other, that not only the learned, but the unlearned, in a due use of ordinary means, may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. The Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek being immediately inspired by God and by His singular care and providence kept pure in all ages are therefore authentical. So as in all controversies of religion, the church is finally to appeal unto them. But because these original tongues are not known to all the people of God who have right unto and interest in the Scriptures and are commanded in the fear of God to read and search them, therefore they are to be translated into the language of every people into which they come, that the Word of God, dwelling plentifully in all, they may worship Him in an acceptable manner and through patience and comfort of the Scripture may have hope." The infallible rule of interpretation of Scripture is a Scripture itself. And therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, which is not manifold but one, it may be searched and known by other places that speak more clearly. The supreme judge by whom all controversies of religion are to be determined and the decrees of councils, opinion of ancient writers, doctrines of men and private spirits are to be examined, and in whose sentence we are to rest can be no other but the Holy Spirit speaking in Scripture. Chapter 2 of the Westminster Confession of Faith There is but one only living and true God who is infinite in being and perfection a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, working in all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will for his own glory, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and withal most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. God hath all life, glory, goodness, blessedness in and of himself, and is alone in and unto himself all sufficient, not standing in need of any creatures which he hath made, nor deriving any glory from them, but only manifesting his own glory in, by, unto, and upon them. He is the alone fountain of all being, of whom, through whom, and to whom are all things, and hath most sovereign dominion over them, to do by them, for them, and upon them whatsoever himself pleaseth. In his sight all things are open and manifest. His knowledge is infinite, infallible, and independent upon the creature so as nothing is to him contingent or uncertain. He is most holy in all his counsels, in all his works, and in all his commands. To him is due from angels and men and every other creature whatsoever worship, service, or obedience he is pleased to require of them. In the unity of the Godhead, there are three persons of one substance, power, and eternity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of 
the Father. The Holy Ghost eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. Chapter 3 of the Westminster Confession of Faith God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Yet so as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. Although God knows whatsoever may or can come to pass upon all supposed conditions, yet hath he not decreed anything because he foresaw it as future or as that which should come to pass under such conditions. By the decree of God, for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestinated unto everlasting life and others foreordained to everlasting death. These angels and men, thus predestinated and foreordained, are particularly and unchangeably designed, and their number is so certain and definite that it cannot be either increased or diminished. Those of mankind that are predestinated unto life, God before the foundation of the world was laid, according to the good pleasure of his will, according to his eternal and immutable purpose, and the secret counsel and good pleasure of his will, hath chosen in Christ unto everlasting glory, out of his free grace and love alone, without any foresight of faith or good works or perseverance, in either of them or any other thing in the create creature, as conditions or causes moving him thereunto, and all to the praise of his glorious grace. As God hath appointed the elect unto glory, so hath he by the eternal and most free purpose of his will foreordained all the means thereunto. Wherefore, they who are elected, being fallen in Adam, are redeemed by Christ, are effectually called unto faith in Christ by His Spirit, working in due season, are justified, adopted, sanctified, and kept by His power through faith unto salvation. Neither are any other redeemed by Christ, effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved, but the elect only. The rest of mankind God was pleased, according to the unsearchable counsel of his own will, whereby he extendeth or withholdeth mercy as he pleaseth for the glory of his sovereign power over his creatures to pass by and to ordain them to dishonor and wrath for their sin to the praise of his glorious justice. The doctrine of this high mystery of predestination is to be handled with special prudence and care, that men attending the will of God revealed in his word and yielding obedience thereunto may, from the certainty of their effectual vocation, be assured of their eternal election. So shall this doctrine afford matter of praise, reverence, and admiration of God, and of humility, diligence, and abundant consolation to all that sincerely obey the gospel. Thank you for joining us this week at the Saybrook Meeting House. We hope you've been blessed by today's podcast. Saybrook Ministries' mission is to provide didactic and devotional content from the Christian faith delivered to the saints, recovered and refined by the Protestant Reformation. Be sure to visit saybrookministries.org for continually updated Christian content designed to inspire and invigorate our imagination and intellect. Join us next week for another journey to the Saybrook Meeting House. 
Until then, may God bless you.